Exciting news unfolds as Starship 28 gears up for static fire testing, marking a pivotal moment in SpaceX's ambitious journey. Plus, after extensive repairs, the orbital launch pad is now fully operational, setting the stage for future launches. Also, breaking news reveals SpaceX's expansion plans, with an official confirmation of a second Starship launch tower in construction at Starbase. Stay tuned for all the latest developments in our episode today. Following almost a month of repairs and upgrades, the orbital launch mount is now almost ready for the next integrated flight test. During the November liftoff, the Starship launch vehicle intentionally pitched away from the launch tower to quickly clear the launch mount and move away from the tower to avoid damage to the structures in case of a launch failure during liftoff or ascent. This pitching maneuver caused the engine exhaust to point straight on one side of the launch mount ring, resulting in a small fire. The fire went out eventually, however, it caused minor damage to the launch mount ring and the booster quick disconnect mechanism. The booster hold-down clamps also incurred some damage during liftoff. Over the past few weeks, teams have been hard at work fixing the launch mount infrastructure and swapping out the hold-down clamps. They also removed the back panel of the booster quick disconnect and worked on the pipes and connections inside. Last Monday, the quick disconnect and its hood were tested for the first time after the repairs. The hood is designed to protect the booster quick disconnect from the super heavy engine exhaust after it retracts. After completing the repairs on the launch mount and booster quick disconnect, workers shifted their focus to the Starship quick disconnect mechanism, which sustained some minor damage during the November launch. The quick disconnect umbilical was first partially detached from the QD arm and then lifted with the help of a crane. Teams devoted the next several hours meticulously working on the intricate mechanism, diligently addressing and rectifying every issue it encountered. After the repairs, the umbilical was reinstalled and the crane was detached from it. Even though the umbilical was damaged, the quick disconnect arm was not harmed during last month's Starship liftoff. SpaceX tested the arm several times during the past few weeks and the system seems to have worked flawlessly. The Starship lifting and stacking arm, also known as chopsticks, was also subjected to repairs and upgrades over the last few weeks. The arm was tested twice after the repairs. During the first test on December 5, the arm was raised to the top of the tower and brought down 10 minutes later. During the second test on December 8, the arm was raised more than half the height of the tower and it was held in that position for the next eight hours. The arm was then lowered to the bottom of the tower. Later, the arm was closed and moved sideways, signaling the end of the testing cycle. It looks like the arm is ready for lifting boosters and ships again. With the extensive repairs and upgrades either finished or nearing completion, the launch pad is primed to host another Starship launch shortly. The next vehicles in line for the integrated flight test are Starship 28 and Super Heavy Booster 10. Starship 28, complete with all six of its Raptor engines installed, left the high bay on early Thursday morning to begin its journey towards the launch site. The self-propelled modular transporter, or SPMT, that carried the ship, sported lively Christmas lights and colorful decorations. It featured a reindeer and three snowmen at the front and a Santa Claus and a dazzling Christmas tree, adorned with lights, at the back. This vibrant display added an extra touch of cheer to the rollout. After a nearly 90-minute long journey, Ship 28 arrived at the launch site and moved towards suborbital launch pad B. The ship was later lifted with the help of a crane and placed atop suborbital pad B. As per the road closure notice, Ship 28's static fire test will happen as early as Monday, December 18. The test could be a six-engine static fire. Super Heavy Booster 10, following the installation of its 33 Raptors, was moved to the Rocket Garden from the Mega Bear recently. The booster will be rolled out to the launch site when the launch mount is fully ready to host static fire tests. The static fire will be further delayed if SpaceX intends to connect the recently installed horizontal propellant storage tanks to the launch mount prior to the Booster 10 testing. Teams are currently working to connect the newly delivered tanks to the heat exchangers, pumps, and pipes at the tank farm. The new tanks and the previously installed horizontal tanks will store methane, oxygen, and nitrogen required for future Starship tests and launch activities. Once operational, the horizontal tanks will replace the vertical storage tanks. SpaceX recently demolished the old Starship suborbital launch pad A. Launch pad A is from where Starships with serial numbers 8, 10, and 15 blasted off in 2020 and 2021 for their high-altitude flight tests. This is also the same pad from which Starship prototypes bearing serial numbers 5 and 6 performed their hop tests. Since SpaceX began focusing on orbital flight tests, pad A was repurposed for cryogenic proof tests. The second suborbital launch pad, pad B, has been used for static fire tests since then. 
Now that all cryo-proof tests have been shifted to the Massey's test site, Pad A has become redundant. On December 12, teams began cutting and removing all the pipes, beams, and columns of Pad A, and eventually, the pad was pushed down with the help of an excavator. The demolition of Starship Suborbital Launch Pad A marks the end of its operational legacy, spanning over three eventful years. Last month, a Starship test tank, labeled Ship 24.2, was placed inside a structural test cage at Massey's. Test Tank 24.2 consists of a Starship aft section, a payload bay section, and a forward section with an elliptical dome and stringers on the exterior. The structural test cage, with pistons installed, is designed to simulate the stresses a Starship will experience during various stages of a flight. An image made public by LabPodre Space last week revealed that the test article was recently tested until it failed inside the test cage. The pressure applied by the test cage caused a bend to form near the payload bay door area, which is clearly visible in the image. The payload bay cutout is one of the weakest regions in a Starship structure. The test results from Ship 24.2 will give SpaceX the required data to determine if the Starship payload bay design will survive the stresses of flight. During a presentation at the Brownsville Events Center on Tuesday, December 12, Starbase General Manager Kathy Lewitters discussed details of the first two integrated test flights and future plans for Starbase. Lewitters described the November 18 Starship launch as a phenomenal event. She stated that the Starship team learned a lot from the data gathered during the first integrated flight test in April and used that information to improve the launch vehicle used for the second flight. Lewitters added that with hot stage separation passing the test on November 18, future test flights will be aimed at validating other key elements of the launch vehicle. She said that next year will be critical for SpaceX as they aim to perform landing operations and reuse the booster stage. As per Lewitters' estimations, the next Starship launch will ideally take place in the first quarter of 2024. Elon Musk previously stated that Starship Flight 3 hardware should be ready to fly before the end of this month. However, given the way things are going right now, that is not going to happen, and an early 2024 launch window seems more realistic. Lewitters added that Starbase is currently bustling with construction activities, and there's a plan in place for a second orbital launch pad. Large steel sections and several metal pieces that resemble the launch tower's columns and beams have already been delivered to the production site. SpaceX has seven prefabricated launch tower sections at its Roberts Road facility at Kennedy Space Center and they have already begun the process of shipping the tower sections to Starbase. The Starship launch tower is constructed out of nine prefabricated sections. It appears that two of the sections will be prefabricated at Starbase, and they will join the seven sections from Kennedy to complete Tower 2. Plans to build a second launch tower at Starbase have been in the works for the past three years. For the 2020 Starbase launch site extension plan, the new tower will be located close to the current launch tower. This is also confirmed by the official Starship launch animation from SpaceX. SpaceX is also building a Starship launch tower at Kennedy Space Center Launch Complex 39A. The basic structure of the tower has already been completed. For the past several months, there hasn't been any notable advancement in the tower and launch pad construction. Launch towers at Starbase and Kennedy Space Center will increase the cadence of Starship launches, helping to speed up Musk's goal of colonizing Mars. Now, let's discuss some of the latest updates from the world of science and technology. Rocket Lab just bounced back from a launch failure and successfully launched an Electron rocket into space. The company's Electron rocket lifted off from its launch site in New Zealand on December 15, carrying the Tsukiyomi-1 satellite for the Japanese Earth imaging company IQPS. The mission, dubbed the Moon God Awakens, was the 42nd mission for the small satellite launcher and its 10th flight in 2023. All went according to plan, and Electron's kick stage deployed Tsukiyomi-1 into a 575-kilometer circular low-Earth orbit about 57 minutes after launch. The Tsukiyomi-1 synthetic aperture radar satellite joins another IQPS satellite on orbit to capture higher-resolution images of Earth, as closely as a 1-meter square view. Eventually, it will be part of a 36-satellite constellation designed to monitor fixed spots on Earth every 10 minutes, even through clouds and adverse weather conditions. IQPS said it aims to have its full constellation deployed by 2025. Friday's Electron mission was a key moment for Rocket Lab after the company was forced to pause launches when its previous mission in September failed. During the September 19 Electron launch, an issue occurred during second stage engine ignition, about two and a half minutes into flight. A brief glow was seen when the rocket's upper stage single Rutherford engine ignited, followed by orange sparks. 
The rocket's telemetry data showed the velocity of the rocket's upper stage decreasing, suggesting the upper stage engine was not generating any significant thrust. Without enough speed to reach orbit, the upper stage failed to place its payload, a synthetic aperture radar spacecraft for the California company Capella Space, into orbit. After two months of investigation into the anomaly, the company found that the issue was caused by an electrical arc inside the power supply system, which shorted out the battery packs that provide power for the second stage. In order to prevent such incidents in the future, Rocket Lab made necessary modifications to the rocket's upper stage. They enhanced ground testing of the upper stage and added more pressure to the upper stage's battery frame section to prevent arcing conditions from forming. Friday's mission success proved that those design modifications worked out. We have a new view of the engine's nozzle that includes a nitrogen bottle that you can see on the top left of your screen, which has been introduced as part of an update to the second stage system. Now this is providing pressurised gas to the enclosure covering the, stage, the second stage electrical system, helping to minimise the chances of electrical arcs. Chinese commercial space flight company, iSpace, has successfully launched and safely landed its hyperbola test article for the second time. On December 10, iSpace launched its Hyperbola 2Y single-stage test vehicle from a test site at the Jiaquin Satellite Launch Center. The prototype flew for 63 seconds, reaching an altitude of 343 meters, before translating 50 meters to a landing zone, and then making a powered descent and soft landing, supported by four landing legs. The precision of the landing was remarkable, with a landing position accuracy of about 0.295 meters and a landing speed of 1.1 meters per second. The latest hop test came just over a month after the first hop test on November 2. The test vehicle ascended to a height of 178 meters in the 51-second test before returning to its landing spot. The 3.35-meter diameter, 17-meter long Hyperbola 2 test stage is powered by a Focus 1 engine that runs on liquid methane and liquid oxygen propellants. The recent flight tests verified the engine's variable thrust propulsion, as well as the test vehicle's vertical landing guidance, navigation, and control systems. The tests are comparable to the Grasshopper test SpaceX conducted in 2011 and 2012 as part of their effort to reuse the Falcon 9 first stage. iSpace says it will attempt a test at sea next year after completing ground tests. The successful hop tests marked major progress towards iSpace's aim to develop the Hyperbola 3 rocket with a reusable first stage by 2025. The 69-meter-long rocket will be able to lift 8.5 tons to low Earth orbit in reusable mode. For comparison, the Falcon 9 can lift 17.4 tons in a reusable configuration. iSpace says it aims to conduct 25 Hyperbola 3 launches per year by 2030. The company also plans to develop Hyperbola 3B, a triple-core version of the Hyperbola rocket, similar to SpaceX's Falcon Heavy in configuration. Hyperbola 3B will be capable of carrying no less than 15 tons into low Earth orbit. NASA plans to launch its Artemis II mission, which will send four astronauts around the moon in late 2024. Artemis II will be crewed by astronauts Commander Reed Wiseman, pilot Victor J. Glover, payload specialist Christina Koch, and mission specialist Jeremy Hansen. While the four astronauts continue their intense 18-month training program that began in June, the hardware that will carry them to space, the Orion capsule and giant space launch system rocket, are being prepared at different NASA centers. The parts of the two solid rocket boosters that will be strapped to the SLS core stage are being processed at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The team is currently inspecting each segment one by one and lifting them to a vertical position to ensure the solid propellant and segments are ready for integration. After each of the 10 segments has finished processing, they will be transported one at a time to the vehicle assembly building in order to be stacked atop the mobile launcher. Standing 54 meters tall and burning approximately 6 tons of propellant every second, the twin boosters provide more than 75% of the total thrust at launch. Meanwhile, at NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, technicians recently rotated the Orion stage adapter and installed a giant diaphragm into it. The stage adapter is a ring structure that connects the Orion spacecraft to the SLS rocket's upper stage. The diaphragm, a composite structure in the shape of a dome, acts as a barrier to keep the highly volatile hydrogen gas from accumulating beneath the Orion spacecraft in the event that it escapes from the rocket's propellant tanks. The installation of the diaphragm marks one of the final steps for the adapter before it is ready for shipment to Kennedy Space Center for integration into the launch vehicle. At NASA's Mishu assembly facility, teams have fully secured the four RS-25 engines onto the core stage of the SLS rocket for the Artemis II flight test. In the coming weeks, engineers will perform testing on the entire stage and its avionics and electrical systems.
Once complete, the core stage will be shipped to Kennedy Space Center for integration with the solid boosters. Thank you for tuning in for the latest science news and Starship updates. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button, leave a comment, and share it with your friends. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and turn on notifications so you never miss an episode.